our everlasting king, we are so privileged once again to come together to feed of the fresh manna that is from above. We come, Lord, with hunger in our soul. We come with A sense of expectation, Lord, that you will feed us, that you will speak to our hearts in the mighty name of Jesus. Therefore, Father, we receive hearing here. We receive understanding hearts and minds. We receive eyes that are open tonight to build wondrous truths from your word in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, no man know the things of a man except the spirit of that man. And the same vein is things of God, not no man except the spirit of God. Therefore, Holy Spirit, we acknowledge our need of you. We acknowledge you are trusted teacher. Therefore, tonight we pray that you will reveal the things of God to us from the pages of, of your word in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We pray, the Bible says that there is a spirit in a man and it is the inspiration of the Almighty that gives them understanding. We ask tonight for understanding through your inspiration and the spirit. We thank you because we know you have answered our prayers. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. We want to thank God for thus far how the Lord has been helping us in our wisdom series. Even as we consider the penultimate topic tonight because after this sixth pillar then we've only got one more uh, pillar to consider and for those that have been with us on this journey you know we started by looking at the wisdom series we saw what biblical wisdom is all about and God helped us to be able to distinguish biblical wisdom from diabolical wisdom and from the wisdom of this world, natural, commonsensical wisdom. And then after that, we also saw the benefits of wisdom. And uh, we began to look at the seven pillars of wisdom house which is found in Proverbs chapter 9, reading from verses 1 to 5. Wisdom has built a house. Everywhere in scripture, where building takes place or where something needs to be built, it is always a handiwork of wisdom. Wisdom is a builder. And we start by saying that if anything is not built, it is because wisdom is lacking. If a life is not built up, wisdom is lacking. If a business is not built up, wisdom is the missing link. If a marriage or a family life is falling apart, it's because wisdom is lacking. And it is upon that premise that we began to look at these foundational principles of wisdom, which are so fundamental that they can make or break people's lives and their destinies. And by the help of the Holy Spirit, we have looked at five of them. You become what you say. You know, being the first pillar, you become what you think. Being the second pillar, you become what you. Believe 
within the circular, then you become what you hear and you eat. He said it's not just sufficient to hear. When we eat what we hear, then we become it. And uh, the fifth pillar which we considered last week is that you become who, who and what you follow. You become who and what you follow. And today we want to look at the sixth pillar. You become what you eat and drink. You become what you eat and drink. It's a popular saying. I'm sure you must have come across it. A lot of people say it, that you are what you eat. You know, but it's also important to add drink to it. Because both physical and spiritual nutrition are important. They are important to us and they are also important to God. And that's the reason why we want to see the wisdom of God about nutrition tonight. What's God's wisdom concerning nutrition? both physical as well as spiritual. But my emphasis tonight will not be so much on the physical because I know a lot of us, we know, we are well informed. The first truth I want to share with us, brethren, is that God is the one who has always chosen man's diet from the perspective of scripture. God is the one who made the choice of man's diet. Before civilization comes to be what it is today, God has always, it has always been God's prerogative. It has always been God's initiative. What man eats, God has not always left it to man. He's always ensured that he makes provisions for man's food. Um, we find that truth in right from the garden when God made the first man and the woman. Genesis chapter 1. Um, Genesis 1. Genesis 1, I'll read a few verses, verse 29 to begin with. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed. I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in, in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for meat AJB says it shall be for meat but we know that the idea is that it shall be for, for food that's your food here we see God having made Adam and Eve given them a prescription of their physical diet and God said their diet should be around the herbs their diet should be from the fruits of the tree that should be their diet. It should be the herbs and it should be the fruits of the trees, which obviously, you know, God himself planted, you know, and God expects them to eat. And in fact, we do know that in the midst of the garden, after God himself has planted the garden and he has put Adam and Eve there, God also made provisions for the kind of fruits that they need to eat. Genesis chapter 2 verse 9. Genesis 2 uh, 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Let's take note. Every tree pleasant to the sight, tree that are good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So, yeah, and then we see three kinds of uh, trees, three categories of trees that God 
had put in the Garden of Eden. You know, we, we see that there is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is in the midst of the garden. That one the, is forbidden. You are not meant to eat from that particular tree. Also in the midst of the garden is the second tree, the tree of life. The tree of life. Um, you know, and I want to believe that God, you know, expected them. In fact, God planted it there so that they can, you know, eat of the tree of life. But in addition to that, there is also the tree, you know, um, of, uh, you know, the one that is pleasant to the sight, the tree that is pleasant to the sight and that is good for food. Take note. That's the third category. So that one is pleasant to the sight and is good for food. They had God's permission to eat from it. So there are three provisions of trees. And God said, one is forbidden, that one leave it for me. Don't touch it. You know, uh, but there are two that are for you. You can eat from those. You know, so right there and then we see, you know, fighting principle. The principle of fighting. You see, when people talk about fighting, they begin to look in the law. But you can see that even fighting, you know, is there and then uh, exemplified in the sense that there are three. But one third, God says, don't touch one third. That belongs to me. But two thirds of the trees. They are yours. You can eat out of those. And, and I've had a commentator saying that this is so, so because, you know, the rebellion in heaven had taken place. And uh, Satan had uh, also laid down the gauntlet. They had laid down a, a challenge. He had, in establishing a rival kingdom, he had laid down a principle of evil. The principle of evil in the sense that it took along with him in the rebellion one third of the angels and two thirds of the angels you know are still on God's side they are God's side so the principle of good is that two thirds belongs to God and the principle of evil is that one third have formed an alliance against Satan and it was on the basis of that principle too that you know that evil you know, that they, they brought the, end, the devil into this garden and lured man and tempted him so that is that one third of the tree that was not meant to be touched. You know, one out of three, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that was able to, you know, tempt man and seduce him and lure him and deceive him so that he could fall and partake of that same principle of evil which Satan himself started. And also in that same Genesis verse 19, verse 19 says, And out of the ground of the Lord God, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called every living creature, that was the name uh, thereof. Now, so we see right then, then that. Um, the gods died for the man before the fall had to do with uh, what the vegetarians are now propagating, you see, and what a lot of uh, some, you know, cre creationists, Christian creationists who believe so much in the creation story are also advocating that, look, let's go back to eating grains, let's go back to eating herbs, let's go back to eating vegetables. Everything that is green is good for us. And uh, there, is a, there is a wisdom there. There is a wisdom there. In fact, studies have been done in so many countries, you know, where they have found out that population, particularly among the religious circles, you know, circles, believers, who strictly adhere to these uh, diets, nutrition, that they tend to have a better quality of life and they actually live long. I think somewhere in the Orientals, they took sample of Christian population there who are strict vegetarians, those who you know, uh, and, and their, their, their idea is based on, or their choice, that choice of lifestyle is based on this Genesis account. You know, that they abstain from every other thing and they, you know, focus solely, primarily on grains and on vegetables and all that. That they tend to have a better quality of life and they tend to live long. So that's the wisdom of God as far as that is concerned. 
But then, of course, after the fall, a man's diet begins to change after the fall. And then um, we see that in Genesis chapter 9. I just want to quickly make a reference so that we see that it's the fall that brought about a change in human's diet. Uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 4 to 6. Genesis 9, 4 to 6. And this is after the uh, days of uh, the flood. For flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall not ye eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, and at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made him man. Now, before the fall, there was nothing, there was no murder. You know, there was no murder. So there was no need for them to kill an animal because nothing had to die before the fall. Man uh, was to live forever. You know, and uh, all of the creations, all of the things that God has created and has, has given Adam dominion over, they were to live forever. But now that man has fallen and he has brought down along with him in the fall, all of creation, the birds, the uh, you know, the fishes in the water, all of creation. Now, so the issue of death came, and of course, we know that it was also when Adam fell that he gave back in that fallen nature to Abel and Cain. And because the uh, human nature is now evil, you know, the idea of death and murder came when Cain murdered his own brother. So it was it was that fall also that brought about the fact that animals you know, should now be slaughtered. And in the slaughtering of the animal, man began to eat flesh, he began to eat meat. And of course, in eating meat, the only thing God had to now do was to forbid the eating of blood with, uh, with the flesh, with meat. Why? Because blood is emblematic. As far as God is concerned, life, you know, equals blood. And God said, look, that has to be poured onto the ground. Because life came out of the dust and it must return there. So even if they kill animals, they must spill the blood on the on the on the ground. It must not be eaten. So that's the thing that God forbid. Then on and on and on also, we also saw there are certain dietary dietary restrictions that God gave Israel as a nation. Uh, I'm not going to read uh, the whole lot because I believe there are things that we are quite uh, familiar with. But they are there in Deuteronomy. Chapter 14, if you begin to read right from uh, verse, uh, verses 3 down to 21. But like I said, I'm not going to read you all. These are dietary restrictions that God gave his covenant people. You see, in each of these, you can see that God is taking the initiative, telling them what they can eat, what they cannot eat. Now, these are God's covenant people. They have come into covenant with him, and yet they were still not free to eat anything they like. And then we see in verse 3, thou shalt not eat any abominable thing. That was very clear. This was a command that God gave Israel under the law. Thou shalt not eat any abominable thing. So let's take note, brethren, so there are things that God referred to and consider as abominable. There are things that he himself regards as abominable. And he begins to give them the list, verse 4. These are the beasts which ye shall not eat. The ox, the sheep, and the goats, the ass, the robot, the fallow deer, and the wild goat, and the pygag, and the wild ox, and the camoys, on and on and on like that. Um, and and the, the thing that is the dividing line between what they are allowed to eat and what they are not allowed to eat is there in verse 6. And every beast that parted the hoof, you know, that parted the hoof, whose Hoof is, you know, parted, is separated, is cloven. Every every uh, beast with a cloven hoof uh, um, that parted the hoof and cleaved the cleft, the cleft into two claws, and cheweth the cord among the beasts that ye shall eat. So the ones that they will eat um, uh, is the one that part the hoof. Or that have a cloven uh, 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 hoof, or that cleaveth their uh, the cleft into two claws. Those 
those are the ones that are permitted to eat. And verse 7, nevertheless, this, this ye shall not eat of them that shew the cord, of them that divide the clothing hoof, as the camel, and the air, and the cone, for they chew the cord, but divide not the hoof. Therefore, they are unclean unto you. So these are the laws, you know. And then swine is also there, you know, um, because God regards the swine uh, or the pigs as being unclean. So, so God made certain uh, 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 dietary rules. And for us, the truth we want to convey here: these things are not. We are not bound by them under the new covenant. They are not, you know, things that we have to live by. But I'm just bring the, bringing them up for us to see. That God is interested in our diet, you know, uh, both in the physical sense as well as is in the spiritual sense. That's the reason why I'm raising. Otherwise, God wouldn't go to an extent to be telling Israel under the covenant, these are clean animals, eat them. These are unclean animals, don't go near them. And then even when our Lord Jesus Christ came in, in the human flesh, in Isaiah chapter 7, the Father still... Um, indicated what his meal would be isaiah chapter 7 verse 15 he wouldn't just let the son eat anything isaiah chapter 7 let me read from verse 14 please say therefore the lord himself shall give you a sign behold a virgin shall conceive and bear his son and shall call his name emmanuel butter and honey shall he eat it's not it's not just free to eat anything say butter and honey shall he eat for what reason that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good that he may know to refuse the evil and choose good you know the quality of the food we eat you know also determines our our level of intelligence there is a there is a direct link between the diet and reasoning there is a direct link and here because the Lord wanted his son to begin to reason at, you know, at a super intelligent level. Because Jesus had to operate, you know, with a surpassing intelligence. Because Jesus' ministry required mental dignity that would put him above, you know, uh, virtually all men, including, you know, the, uh, the priests and you know, all the chief priests and the Sadducees and Pharisees. Because he needed to operate at that level of intelligence and mental prowess, God had to also uh, specify his diet. So he had to eat butter and he had to eat honey. I've brought all this up so that we know, brethren, that what we eat is essentially what we become. Now, another truth I want us to see is that both physical and spiritual nutrition supplies energy and strength that's essentially the reason why we eat we eat for strength we eat for energy we eat for energy for uh, physical food that's why when somebody has not eaten for you know a few hours or few days he begins to feel weak why because it's deprived of the energy that the body needs uh, to 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 function um and and strength is also uh, uh, deprived uh, let's see that in psalms Chapter 104. So God has uh, given us food primarily for energy and for strength. Psalms 104, verses 14 to 15. He caused the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man. This is what God does. God causes the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man, that he may bring forth food, food out of the earth. Verse 15, and wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengthens man's heart. What does bread do? It strengthens man's heart, because nutrition, both in the physical sense and spiritual sense, is meant to supply energy and strength also life essentially is sustained by diet that's a principle we need to know our life is sustained by the manner of food that we eat uh, the popular verse there is matthew chapter 4 
Matthew 4, verse number 4. For he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Whichever way you know you see you want to interpret the scripture, you know, he's talking, he's telling us the means by which man will live. It is not only by bread, but by the word. In other words, in the physical sense, we need bread to live. However, God doesn't just want us to live only in the physical sense. That's why I said not alone. He doesn't want us to live, you know, by bread alone, because that would then mean we're only living physically, we'll be dead spiritually. But because he also wants us to live in a spiritual sense, then he's given us a spiritual diet, which is uh, the living word of God. And I will try and emphasize that a bit more when we get to spiritual diet. You know, but life is sustained primarily by by diet. Um, I've often wondered why is it that once we are born again as believers, we have the new life, the new nature. We are still required, you know, to to study the word of God. You know, after all, we are born again. Our spirit is alive. It's God conscious. You know. It is because we need to study God's word because the God's word now becomes the food that will sustain eternal life. It is the food that renews that life. It is the food that grows that life, that develops that life. It is the food that sustains eternal life. It is very, very crucial, you see, um, that uh, when, when God made Adam and Eve, they were already to live eternally before the fall. They had that capacity because they didn't have any sin. There was no death coming. So when God made them, God created them with the intention that they will live forever. But then God still gave them a, a tree of the of the uh, a tree of life for them to feed on. Why? After all, He has made them to live forever. Why do they still need to live, you know, to eat of a tree for them to live forever? It is because that life in itself. You know, it's not self-sustaining. This thing needs to feed off something that is from God. And that is the truth, brethren. I want us to uh, to understand. That you see, when God made man, as good as God has made man, and as well intentioned as God made Adam, God made him to be dependent on him. He made him to be dependent on him. We must not, uh, 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 please, let's uh, bear that in mind. In fact, it, it is the reason why man was made naked. The very primary reason why God made Adam naked was so that he can be totally dependent on God. God doesn't want him to look to himself for anything. And as long as he you know, was naked, you know, and he was God dependent, he was not ashamed. There was no sense of, you know, a, a, a shame. Because he really couldn't see himself in his nakedness, God's glory has covered him. Because then he can depend and lean totally upon God. And because of that dependence too, it is the reason why God, you know, uh, uh, gave them that tree of life so that they can eat, of, you know, uh, from that tree. And that tree is the kind of the life of God. It's the picture of the life of God. It's the picture of the eternal life, primarily, that we will receive in the new uh, covenant, the life that God himself has in himself. So God wants them to feed off that life for them to primarily remain alive. And so it's important, brethren, for us to, to see that. So it's in the same sense, also even though we are born again, if we don't feed on the word of God, that eternal life within you know, us becomes weak. It becomes weak, you know. Because it cannot grow, it cannot develop, it is not sustained apart from the word of God. And that is why you see Christians, some of them they are easily defeated, some are weak in their faith. And all because they are not feeding off the life of God that comes to the world. The word of God is the life of God. And it is in feeding on that life that our, you know, our, our spiritual life, the eternal life that we have, that we have received as salvation. That is how that life is programmed or designed to grow. Now let's see the impact of physical and spiritual nourishment. What impact would they have? 
in the physical sense, healthy uh, food provides the right kinds of energy to enhance the operation of the body's complex system. All of those complex systems, the mind, you know, initiating activities and the rest of the body, you know, responding and all of the, you know, things that is going on uh, in the body. It is because of the healthy food that is provided. It, you know, so that's why it enhances that operation. It also strengthens the resilience of the human body against diseases. Healthy, you know, it, uh, diet it strengthens the re resilience of uh, the human body against disease, and it increases its durability and its longevity. Um, I think let, let's look at Psalms 103, verse 5. Psalms 103. Verse number five. Psalm one of three, verse five. Say, who satisfies thy mouth with good things? You can, you know, think about those good things as good food, good diet. God satisfies our mouth with good things. For what purpose? So that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Your newt is renewed like the eagles. You know, it is the reason why some people, because of poor diet, they look older than their age. And when you compare them with some other people who eat healthily, they look younger than their age. That's what that scripture is saying. Because good food, you know, increases durability and longevity and it also helps, uh, uh, strengthens the body to fight against uh, uh, disease. Also, junk food has exactly the opposite effect and it contributes to the breaking down of the body. In fact, it has the capacity to shorten lifestyle, uh, life, lifespan, I beg your pardon. It has the capacity to shorten uh, lifespan. Psalms 107 verse 18. 107 verse 18. Their soul are buried. All manner of meat or food, and they draw near unto the gates of death. They were dying because all manner of food that was being provided for them, they just didn't want them. They didn't want to take them. Their soul abhors it. They hate it. All manner of meat. Therefore, they were drawn. They were gradually dying. They were drawn near unto the gates of death. Now, the important uh, truth, brethren, I want to share with us tonight, just before we move into the sources of spiritual diet and its relevance for us, is that God wants us to accept responsibility. He has given each and every one of us responsibility for stewardship of our body. It's important because God is interested in our diet. He has also given us, that comes with a sense of responsibility. And the responsibility is that we have to watch what we eat in order so, so we can take care of, of our body. That's the responsibility the Lord has uh, given us. Um, in First Corinthians chapter 6, First Corinthians 6 verse 19, what know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Even if there is nothing else you want to take uh, away with you, uh, brethren, from uh, tonight's uh, study, please let us remember this: you are not your own. Your body is not your own. Say no, you not. It's God's temple. Is God's property. You don't own it. You don't own it. I don't own my body. It, it's not mine. So when you begin, just like every other resources we have, we are mere stewards. A steward is an, it's, 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 an, uh, it, it's a minister. It's, it's a servant who administers. A steward is an administrator. The one who is placed in trust and in charge of another man's resources. That's who his steward is. And when it comes to everything we have in the kingdom, our money, you see, that's why the mentality of, um, it's my money, or I'm a millionaire, it's a, it's a wrong mentality. 
you know, it's not your own. It's someone else's. We have just been put, you know, in, in, in as a steward, a trustee to look after it on behalf of the real owner. Our children, they don't belong to us. We are stewards. The job that we do is not us. It's God's. And when we begin to, you know, live with this understanding, then our approach to our finances will change. We cannot just spend money anyhow because it doesn't belong to us. Imagine you have a, you know, a business and you put somebody there as a manager. They manage this business for you. Can he spend that money anyhow? He can't. It's not his money. It is your money. You are the one who owns the business. In that sense. It's the same thing with everything God has given us. Our time. We are, we are, a, we are managers. We are stewards. God owns the time. Our resources, our intellect. Everything, everything, I mean everything that God has given us, including our body. Say, you are not your own. And because it's not our own, we must be particular how the owner wants the body to be looked after. And it is also for that reason that the owner has also made a prescription of the kind of good things that he wants us uh, to eat. Verse 20, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And in your spirit, which are God's. We are bought with a price. You know, God paid a price, a ransom price to redeem you. And he wants us to glorify him, both in our spirit as well as in our body. That is why for me, the issue of uh, whether a Christian needs to smoke or not, it does not arise. The issue of whether should a Christian drink alcohol or not, is not a debatable issue from my standpoint. Because I know that I'm a steward, so I'm not free to drink anything I, 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 I like. I'm a steward, I'm not free to eat anything I like. So if the owner has not specifically recommended that I should smoke, I should take cigarettes, then it's not a question, it's not debatable. And you will never find it anywhere in scripture where God, you know, tacitly or, you know, uh, 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 holy endorses smoking. Or where God says we can drink. You see? You can't find it. Or drink alcohol. That's what I mean. Because God knows that it's injurious to our health. It's injurious to our body. He would not recommend it. God will not recommend it. And so it's important also for us brethren. To know that this body is given to us. So we can glorify God in our body. That verse 20 is very very important. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God. You see, this is different from God himself glorifying himself in our body. This is a responsibility he's given you and I. God said, I have bought you with a price. You go down therefore and glorify me in your body and in your spirit because they belong to me. So it's a responsibility that's committed to us to glorify uh, him through our body. And then in First Corinthians chapter 3, Verse 17, if any man defile the temple of God. I know in this context, he's talking about defilement by uh, means of fornication. Because these uh, you know, Christians in the Corinthian church, they were actually going to temple prostitutes. In those days, there are certain temples that have been you know, built for the worship of eating gods. Diana, and all of that, eating gods. And uh, you know, some prostitutes will always come there. You know, and Christians uh, in the Corinthian church, you are actually going there with the purpose of getting themselves defiled and sleeping with temple prostitutes in hidden uh, temples. And this was what Paul was trying to uh, write against here. You know, if any man defile the temple of God, the body of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So the issue of uh, why I, whether I should drink alcohol, it doesn't arise. This body is holy. Anything that can enjoy it, anything that can harm it, is a defilement. And God says, if we permit defilement, you know, uh, to come, then it's going to destroy the body. It's going to destroy the body. That's what the owner says. And so we have a God-given responsibility to look after after it. Sources of spiritual diet. I've mentioned uh, one in the passing, and I will just re-emphasize it again. One primary source of spiritual diet, brethren, is the Word of God. Our spirit needs to be fed with the Word. Why? Let's remember 
that when God made things in Genesis, there is a principle, there is a law that was at work. And the law was that whatever God produced, the environment out of which that thing is produced is the environment that will keep it alive, is the environment that will sustain it. For example, God commanded the ground you know, to produce trees. He spoke to the ground to bring forth all manner of vegetations. Why you know, do you think then that the plants can survive outside of the ground? It's not possible. Because whatever God makes or has made in, you know, in, uh, at creation, they are sustained by the environment that produces them. Uh, another example is the fishes in the waters. God commanded the waters, after the waters had first been made, God commanded the waters to you know, bring forth fishes. And the waters brought forth fishes. And right from that day, that law is has been in operation that as long as fishes they rest in the water and they, they swim in the water and they do everything within the water, it brings out the best in them because that's their natural habitat. That is the habitat in which they can grow. That's the habitat in which they can swim and do all, all manner of, of, of stuff. But the moment you take them out of that natural habitat that produces them, then they begin to die. And it is also the very reason, uh, brethren, why we need the habitat of the word of God for our spirit, for the for the life of God we receive, the eternal life we receive as salvation, for that life to grow and for that life to be sustained. Why is it so? The Bible says somewhere, I think in First Peter or, or, or so, not, I'm not very sure, that that being born again, not of the corruptible seed, but by the incorruptible which is the living word of God that abides forever. So the eternal life that we have, that we receive that salvation, the life that Christ had in himself, which was also you know, uh, given to us as salvation, that life is produced by the word of God that we receive. When we, go, we have, hear God, the word of God and we believe, it is faith in the word that births eternal life in us. And that eternal life, because it's a product of the Word of God, will only be sustained, will only be developed by the Word of God. And that is why the Word of God as a diet for our uh, for the life of God in us is very, very crucial. If you go days without it, you are weakening, you are weakening, you know, uh, your, 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 your inner man. You are weakening your spiritual man, the man on the inside, without the Word of God. And that's why we need to feed it. We need to meditate upon the word. We need to nurture the spirit man within us, the, the new man on the inside by the word of God. Another sort of spiritual uh, uh, diet, brethren, is that we need to feed from the tree of life. We need to feed from the tree of life. We have seen that tree of life that God gave them uh, in Genesis, that when God uh, first made uh, planted the garden, he put the uh, tree there. And uh, also in Revelation, there is also the tree of life, which is in heaven. Uh, just quickly read the few scriptures there, that there is a tree of life in heaven. Revelation chapter 2, uh, verse 7, Either hath and air, let him hear what the Spirit said on the churches, to him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Some commentators believe that it was the same tree that was in the, in the heaven. As soon as man fell and God broke them out, that was, you know, uh, transplanted, you know, to heaven. And then, of course, in Revelation 22, you know, that tree of, you know, of life is also in, I think I should read that too, it's also in, uh, it's in the paradise in the midst of God. And when the heavenly Jerusalem is going to come down upon the earth, that same tree is also going to come down. That is the explanation. That's the basis for which people took that position. That if the tree is in heaven, in the, in the midst of the paradise in heaven, and it's also going to come down in the new Jerusalem, there must have been the first one that was in the Garden of Eden that was tram, transplanted, you know, uh, uh, there. Revelation 22, verse 2 says, In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, 
which bore twelve manner of fruits, and yielded a fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. It meant the, the nations were to he, eat from that tree, just like Adam was eating from it. In this day, in this time that is yet in the future, in the millennium, the nations will not be sick anymore. They will not be sick. So the healing of nation is not there because they will be sick. It is talking about sustenance of their life. The trees will be there to sustain life. It will be there for their welfare. It will be there for their well-being. That's all that that, that tree would be. But between uh, Eden you know, and, the, and, and the future, when the tree would also appear, the tree in the paradise in heaven, when it will appear literally and physically in the new Jerusalem that shall come down from heaven, God also wants us in a spiritual sense, not in a physical sense, to feed off the tree of life. And for us, what is the tree? Uh, the book of Proverbs gives us a clue to what the tree of life is for us in this dispensation, in the church age. Proverbs chapter 3, verse, uh, verse 8. Proverbs 3, sorry, verse 18. Proverbs 3, verse 18. Talking about wisdom. She is the tree of life to them that lay hold upon her. And happy is everyone that retaineth her. She is a tree of life. And when we uh, talk about wisdom, when we start there, we say Christ is wisdom of God personified. So the tree of life is Christ. It's also the wisdom of God. For us in the age, the life of Christ is also the tree of life for us. That relationship with him, you know, that commitment to Christ, that relationship to Christ, living, you know, uh, 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 feeding upon, upon Christ, being united to Christ, being one with Christ, that is our tree of life. When we are one with him, when we are united with him, when our life, when we are living it for Christ, when we are living, you know, uh, uh, by faith in Christ, that we are feeding off that tree of life. And also when we live according to the wisdom of, of the word of God, we are also live, uh, uh, living off that tree of life. Wisdom is a tree of life to those that laid upon her. Proverbs 11 verse 30. Proverbs 11 verse 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. When we are in the community of believers, and, uh, and we are all fruitful together, you know, we can feed off the fruit of one another, and it becomes life to us. It becomes life to us. You know, when you are showing love to me as a fruit of the Spirit, and uh, that love, you know, that you are updating in a community of believers, you know, and other believers are feeding off that fruit. It becomes to them a tree of life. When you are radiating joy and you come to a you know, community of believers, other believers around you, they are feeding off the joy you are radiating. And that joy could, to them becomes the fruit, it becomes a tree of life. The Bible says that fruit of the righteous, our, our, our fruitfulness, when we are yielding fruit, particularly the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, you know, uh, uh, kindness, temperance. When we are manifesting this fruit, other believers, as they begin to, you know, uh, 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 feed off those things, our manifestation, our fruitfulness, become to them a tree of life. Also, Proverbs 13, verse 12. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12. Hope different maketh the heart sick, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. When desire comes, it is a true, uh, 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 it's a tree of life. You see, hope is, in a sense, a tree of life. And we know that hope comes also uh, uh, from the Word of God, just like faith comes from the Word of God. You see, what, what uh, physical food does to the human body is what hope does to the soul. The physical food strengthens the human body. Hope strengthens the mind. It strengthens the soul. And it's in that sense that hope also becomes a tree of life. It strengthens the soul. 
you know, the soul is joyful, the soul is expectant, the soul is forward looking when there is hope. The reason why a lot of people are dying, why a lot of people, you know, fall sick, and a lot of people, you know, tragedies before people is because first and foremost, they are, there's hopelessness. The moment men begin to lose hope, they begin to lose the will to live. That's why the enemy first, you know, attacks people with hopelessness. They just look at life and say, I'm fed up. There's nothing for me in this life. Once there's hopelessness, when there's despair, once there's despondency, then they don't see the reason to live, and so they begin to die physically. And that is why hope is a tree of life. It's a hope that is deferred. It makes the heart to see. It sickens the heart when hope is deferring. It's deferring because that, that be, then that it be, turns into hopeless situation. You are hoping and you are hoping and you are hoping, and the negative that gets you know uh, 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 um, fulfilled. Then the heart begins to get weary. But when desire comes, or when hope is fulfilled, it is a tree of life. So this is a tree of life for us in the dispensation. Fulfillment of our hope is important, brethren. God does not want our hope perpetually deferred. He wants hope to be fulfilled. Hope that is based upon the word of God. I'm not talking about wishful thinking. Just thinking where everything will be okay. No, I'm talking about confident expectation of good based upon the assurances of scriptures, based upon the promises of the word of God, you are confidently you know, expecting good to come to you. That's the hope that the Bible talks about. And that hope, when it comes, then it becomes a tree of life. And then the final reference is uh, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 4. Proverbs 15, verse 4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a bridge in the spirit. That is why, we are, you know, what we see is very, very important. A wholesome tongue, a healthy tongue, a gracious tongue, a tongue that gives up words, that will encourage, that will build up, that will minister, is a tree of life. But a tongue that is full of hell, that is full of fire, that sets emotion, the causes of, 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 of nature, that is a destructive uh, 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 tree. It is, in fact, a tree of the knowledge of good and of evil, and it should be avoided. Now, another source of spiritual diet, brethren, is the covenant meal. The covenant meal. Um, the covenant meal there is actually the Lord's Supper, what is called the Eucharist in some churches, or what is also known as the Holy Communion. The Holy Communion, but I Used to, I, I prefer to call it the covenant meal. Psalms 41, verse 9. Psalm 41, verse 9. I'm going to spend a, a little bit of time here uh, because there's the truth. I'm trusting the Lord to bring across. Psalms 41, verse 9. Yea, my own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, had lifted up his heel against me. This is a Messianic psalm. David, by the Spirit of the Lord, is talking about an event that Jesus Christ and the disciples will fulfill when they will come together you know, uh, in the Passover night, the last supper before his death, on that Passover night, that last supper. So this is predictive of that event. Uh, but there is something here that I want us to note that he is a familiar friend, Judas was familiar to our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, he one of, was one of his disciples. He said, in whom I trusted, Jesus trusted him. That's why they gave him the pause. That's why he was numbered among you know, the disciples. That's why he gave him authority to cast out demons. And he did all that the rest of the disciples did because the master trusted him. He had bread with the master. In fact, on that day, on that fateful night at the Passover table, he said the one who did you know, uh, and with me in the same, you know, call is the one that betrays him. So he was eating at that close, you know, range with the master, dipping hands together with him, taking the bread, you know, with him, taking the wine with him. And he said, he's the one that betrayed him. Why am I emphasizing this? In the Eastern cultures and in so many other cultures, one proof of covenant is when they eat together. When people begin to go to each other's houses and they begin to eat, they share the same meal together, 
it is a sign, a symbol of covenant relationship. It is a sign of an intimacy of friendship in Eastern, you know, uh, cultures and so many other cultures like that. You know, they, it's an unwritten covenant that they are friends and they are bound together, you know, by their, by a cord of friendship that is tied when they begin to share meal together. So every time that communion, you know, is, is set and we come together to eat, let's remember this, brethren, that we are coming together to affirm a covenant of friendship, that we are friends together and that we are bound by the same cord, uh, 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 cord together. And that cord is Jesus Christ and all that Jesus did for us on the cross. And unfortunately, the one that was bound together as Jesus' friend was the very one that lifted up his heel against him. What Judas did was a betrayer of that covenant. It was the betrayer of covenant. Now, in Luke chapter 22, verse 20. Luke 22, verse 20. Likewise, also the cup, also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament or the New Covenant. In my blood, which is shed for you. When we come to the communion, we take the cup. It represents the New Testament or the New Covenant in His blood, sealed by His blood. So we are affirming our covenant with Christ. We are affirming our covenant relationship with Christ. We are affirming the fact that we have come into the New Covenant, which was ratified by the shed blood of our Lord jesus christ that is what the communion is about now the aspect i also want to emphasize here is that the communion then also apart from being a covenant becomes for us a spiritual meal it is a spiritual meal remember in john gospel one of the hard truths that the jewish people could not endure was when Jesus told them that except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and you drink of my blood, then you don't have life in you. And they thought he was, you know, uh, teaching cannibalism. They took it in, you know, uh, 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 literally, uh, literally, really. But Jesus Christ, of course, was talking about the spiritual. You know, you have to, you, you, you have to feed off me by faith. You know, by coming into it. Uh, uh, a relationship with me, then by becoming one with me, you are feeding off me. Through faith in me, by believing in me, you are feeding off me. It's, a, it's feeding off by relationship, by union with Christ. That is what Jesus was uh, talking about. But they took that uh, 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 teaching uh, literally. Now, um, what does the communion do for us? And this is very, very crucial, uh, uh, brother. You know when Israel, when they were hungry in the wilderness, God gave them heaven manna. God did not provide the food that is physical for them. God had to supply the supernatural food for them. And because God gave them supernatural meal, the nutrients that they got from that meal, what was being supplied to them was supernatural. It was a supernatural meal because you can some say. says it is angels that God gave them. And each time I ponder about manna, I begin to ask myself questions. Angels are eternal beings. They don't die. They don't die. They are eternal beings. So, they, so, so why do they need manna in heaven? These are spiritual beings that will live forever. The food can give them strength. They are, they, are, they are strong. One angel can be, you know, we saw it in scriptures. One, you know, destroy hundreds, you know, of, of, of thousands of people. One angel in one night. About 138,000, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. In one, one day. One angel. They are that strong. The Bible says they excel in strength. Yeah, so that me. manna was not given for strength for them. Because they already have strength. The manna was right, not yeah. natural, uh, essentially given for them. You know, to be alive mm. because they are eternal beings, they are created beings by God, and they are they, they, they will live for, for eternity. But yet, God gave them that food to eat. You know, but the more I think about it, I think primarily it's not really you know uh, them that, that that needed it. It was actually Israel in the wilderness that needed it. 
it was a provision for angels. But ultimately, God knew that Israel, they are going to come to a time in the wilderness for 40 years that they needed supernatural meal that would give them supernatural nutrients. And we saw the impact that that manna had on them. Their shoes were not worn. Their legs were not swollen. Their clothes did not become old for 40 years. And these were men that were trekking. These were men that were walking through a uh, wilderness where there are trees, where there are, you know, wild animals, and all that, day and night, with all manner of changes in weather, they were exposed to all manner of, uh, you know, hardships, all manner of harsh conditions, and yet there was none that was sick amongst them. You won't find that record mm -hmm. in Popo mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. Because they were sick, they couldn't know. There was no sickness, there was no death, except if they disobeyed and God judged them. There was no death, and there was no, there was no weakness, and yet, you know, there, there was no, 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 no disease, nothing whatsoever, by virtue of the food that God gave them. And mm -hmm. I submit to us, brethren, that for us under this dispensation, God is not a God who is partial. God is not, in Bible says, be far from the Almighty to do wickedly. He has also made the provisions for you and I, and that provision Brethren, it's in the communion. And we see that in Psalms 92, verses 13 to 15. Psalms 92. Psalms 92. 92, verses 13 to 15. Those that be planted in the house of God, of the Lord, they shall flourish in the court of our God. But sorry, let me begin from verse 12. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. Using the tree, palm tree now, right, is the for the righteous. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. And we know that these trees, if there is anything about the palm trees, and like the cedars in Lebanon, they are durable. They live long. Hundreds and hundreds of years, they live long. And so, so God is comparing longevity of our life to these trees. The righteous shall flourish like the palm trees. It shall grow, take note, grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Very durable trees. Verse 13, those that be planted, because they are trees, those that be planted in the house of the Lord, they shall flourish in the courts of our God. Verse 14, they shall still bring forth fruit in old age. Take note, they are evergreen. Even at old age, they are, they are bringing forth fruit. They shall be fat. They shall be flourishing. In this picture, you don't see weak, weakness. You don't see feebleness. You don't see tiredness. You don't see death. You don't see disease. And when you look at the patriarchs, Joshua, Abraham, Isaac, and all that, what does the Bible say about them? People like uh, uh, even uh, Caleb, even at 80 something, their natural force was not abated. Their eyes were not green. We're not doing at 82 or 84. Caleb said, Give me this mountain, let me go and, and, and defeat the enemy. He was that strong by virtue of the secret that they enjoyed. And what is that secret? And that's what I want us to see. So, we have seen the picture of the righteous here, you know, that he's strong, even at what he's fat and he's flourishing. But what is the provision? And the provision God has made for that to happen is in Psalms 104. Psalms 104. We have a covenant provision in God for longevity and for our well being. Psalm 104. Please bear with me one second. Yes. Right. Now, verse 104. I've read a few verses before. Um, but just to put in context so that we know it's God that we are talking about from verse 14 again. It causes the grass to go for the cattle and help for the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth. Verse 15. And wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, 
and bread which strengthen man's heart. Verse 16, the trees of the Lord. And we have seen it. We have seen cedar of Lebanon, you know, and we have also seen the palm tree. And these are the trees which represent God's children. Because it says the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like cedars. So when he's talking about the trees of the Lord, now he's not talking about the righteous here. Say the trees of the Lord, they are full of sap. So the reason why the righteous will flourish like palm trees is because it's full of sap. The reason why it will grow, the righteous will grow like the cedar in Lebanon is because they are full of sap. Say the trees of the Lord. The trees that the Lord himself has planted. Say they that be planted in the house of God, they shall flourish. The trees of the Lord, they are full of sap. The cedars of Lebanon, which he has planted. Brethren, I want to tell me to us tonight that the covenant sap, the sap of our spiritual supernatural nutrients, that God has provided for us, for the tree. we who are the trees of his planting, is this covenant meal. As we partake of the communion, we are receiving supernatural sap. We are receiving spiritual nutrients, such that will make us to be, you know, to begin to flourish, such that will make us to begin to grow, such that even when we are old age, we become fat, we be flourishing, in order to show that the Lord is upright. And that is our rock, and there is no unrighteousness within. Another source, uh, 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 my apologies, I know I've, uh, I've run uh, uh, over time, but I'll be bringing it to an end in the next two or so minutes. Another source of our spiritual uh, diet is found in John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verses 31 to 34. John 4. 31. Our Lord Jesus Christ gave us another source. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. Physical food. They were recommending for him because he has not eaten and he's been there with the woman at the well of Jacob preaching to, to her. Verse 32. But he said unto, unto them, I have meat of food to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, had any man brought him up to eat, they were alarmed. They were surprised. It's, it's been going hours, trekking and walking and all that. And he's been preaching too. He was tired. He needed food. He needed water. And yes, he said, look, there's a food that I have that you, you are not aware of. And what is that food? Verse 34. Jesus said unto them, my meat of food is to do the will of him that sent me. And to finish his work. Another source of spiritual diet and spiritual uh, 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 strength, brethren, is doing God's will. Being committed to that which God has committed into our hands. Doing his will. Fulfilling God's assignment for our life. There is no source of any spiritual energy more than that. When you discover purpose, the reason why God has created you, the reason why God has brought you to the United Kingdom or wherever you are living, the reason why you are doing what you are doing, the ministry God has for you, the assignment that God has for you, the vision that He has for you, when you are pursuing it with the intention of fulfilling it, with the intention of finishing it, there is no greater source of spiritual strength. He brings energy, He brings strength, all of God's abilities in your life begin to flow. They begin to flow because you'll be in your environment, you'll be in your natural environment. Your giftings will find expression. The wisdom of God will be maximized in your life. And the things you begin to lay your hands, they begin to prosper. That is what gave Jesus a, 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 a physical vitality. The fact that he was doing the will of the Father, preaching and leading the soul you know, uh, uh, to the kingdom, Gave him you know, so much spiritual energy that he did not even feel any uh, physical weakness or physical tightness. He didn't even you know, uh, feel any need for physical food. The challenge I want to leave with us, brethren, finally, particularly as, as it relates to physical food, brethren, that we need to receive grace 
to change our taste preferences. Where we have found ourselves, you know, getting used to things that are not too good for us, maybe because they are too sugary or they are too salty, or they are not just the right kind of food for us. Our, the take home for us tonight is for us to receive grace as stewards, recognizing that this body, they belong to God, and for us to begin to make amends. And the Lord will give us grace in Jesus' name. And also want to mention this too. Let us not for uh, join the ways of the world. God has given us spiritual patterns. That is what he, uh, we should follow. He has given us food that we need to uh, uh, to feed up. That's what we should feed up. The world is putting all of their energies and their efforts, you know, running elder scatter, you know, uh, 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 to 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 be, to the healthy. You know, they, they overdo the kind of thing they do. There are a lot of do's and don'ts. Don't eat this, don't eat that, don't do that. Many are committing hours on end to uh, fitness, you know, by going to gym and all that. You know, as, as much as these things are good, right? We say physical, uh, um, physical uh, uh, exercise profit a little. You know, bodily exercise profit a little. As long as that's good, they are ultimately not the source of our, uh, our, our health. They are not the source of our well-being. In fact, the best they can produce for anyone, no matter how addicted people are to, to them, the best they can give them is fitness. Health and healing can only come from the Lord. And God has given us His appointed media by which we can receive God's kind of well-being, Jesus' kind of welfare. It is by feeding off the Word of God, eating from the tree of life, the covenant meal, and then doing His will. And as we begin to receive spiritual uh, nourishment, they begin to impact radically our physical well-being. And of course, in addition to that also, we should also are uh, encouraged and admonished to eat a uh, um, uh, uh, good uh, and healthy food in, in, in a physical sense. But I want to thank you. We appreciate you. We give you glory. We exalt your name. We receive grace and capacity. Lord God, to eat good things which are provided in Jesus' name. If there have been addictions in the things we drink, addictions to alcohol, addictions to uh, what, whatever we, we have become addicted to that is not good for us, that is hurtful, that is defiling our body, Lord God will receive deliverance by knowledge, by light that we have received tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. We receive grace, O oh God, to make amends. In Jesus' name, we break off chains. You know, we are aware, Lord God, that they are controlling habits. We we, 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 we we lose their grip over our destinies. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, whosoever the Son of God shall set free, spring day, we decree and assert our freedom. In the name of Jesus. Your word says we shall know the truth, and the truth shall set us free. Even for as many of us who appear as bound to things which are legitimate, but ultimately, you know, you know, they are not good for us. For, for instance, gluttony is, is not good for us. You know, overeating is not good. Eat is good, but when it comes over, excessive, it becomes another issue. Father, help us to make amends. Grant us liberty. Grant us deliverance. All this you have asked and we have received in, fresh, in, in Jesus' precious name. Amen.